Support for this show comes from Lead Quizzes. Lead Quizzes helps you easily set up high converting quizzes to capture and qualify leads for your business. Visit leadquizzes.com slash podcast to get a 14-day free trial today. But that's not to say there wasn't a time where we just put it all in line, right? There was. There was this day where we just said, we're done. No more projects, no more proposals. We're not sending anywhere out. We're saying no to new business. I remember writing emails to clients saying, you know, just letting you know we're decided not to bid on this project. We wish you the best of luck. The end, right? And it's kind of terrifying because dinner is attached to those projects. And I had three small kids at the time. From Lead Quizzes, it's Journey to Seven Figures, a show about entrepreneurs and the stories behind how they grew their business to seven figures and beyond. We cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the lessons they learned along the way. So welcome back to Journey to Seven Figures. Today, I'm interviewing Garrett Moon, CEO and co-founder of CoSchedule. CoSchedule helps more than 9,000 marketing teams stay organized with their marketing content through the planning, publishing, and promotion stages. He's helped them grow to over seven figures in revenue, 1.5 million monthly page views to their website, and over 350,000 email subscribers. Very excited to interview Garrett today and learn about his journey to seven figures. Garrett, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeremy. Good to be here. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm really excited. I know we've got a lot to cover today. So let's jump into kind of the beginning. So let's start first with Today Made Agency and maybe the idea behind it and what you guys were doing there. Yeah, Today Made, a long time ago, it was me and my current co-founder, Justin, started a service-based company actually as our first business together. And we did web design, software development, marketing consulting, that sort of thing. And that really, in some ways, we always talk about as sort of a way to support our habit of building SaaS-based software and applications. So we would, by day, work with clients, building, doing projects for them. And then in the evenings, we would break out our code and actually build software. So that company, we actually started it, we had the goal of transitioning our revenue from 100% service-based to 50% supported by products and then 50% supported by service. And so we did all kinds of stuff. We were launching, we built our own custom content management system. We probably launched like six or seven different like SaaS applications. Some of them were up live for like a month. Some of them lasted a couple of years and never got us that 50-50 mark. But nonetheless, we were trying and shipping software a lot. So our days as early struggling software developers supported by an agency are the reality of where we came from. <laughs> okay. So like to frame this up for the listeners, this was about five years out of college for you. Yeah, something like that. I had about five or six years in advertising and as a professional before we left and started our own company. Okay. So you worked on this for about three years and then that's around when CoSchedule started. So today made agency 2010, CoSchedule in 2013. Yep. How far were you able to like get the agency before you found CoSchedule and you're like, this is what we want to move forward with? Yeah, I think we were probably about a five or six person agency at that time. And we had started transitioning. The business was a really good spot where we had a few really large contracts that we had worked towards and had built. So we had really good revenue from the agency that we were able to spend some of the time. We'd probably be out looking for new business, actually working on co-schedule, validating the idea trying to understand what the customer is going to need. And, and for us, it was really a different approach. I think as agencies, and this is, I think, one really important thing to realize is that as agencies, it's really easy to think, hey, I can build this piece of software and I can sell it to my current agency customers, plus I can sell it as a SaaS app. And you kind of feel like you have this win-win. Mm-hmm. And we did that. We tried that. That was a giant mistake. Like That is one of the things about CoSchedule that really set it apart from like those seven or the eight other SaaS applications that we were building. because. The reality is, is that in order for CoSchedule to succeed, we have to be able to sell it to people we don't have a pre-existing relationship with. And so when you're an agency and you have service customers, it's really easy to leverage that relationship to get feedback on your software or to get them to buy it. And you kind of get this false sense of validation. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like selling software to your you know, like uncle or your mom or something like that. Like You're utilizing the relationship to get there. So with CoSchedule, it really became about like, we don't even bother talking to our clients about this. We don't even bother asking about it or anything. Like We're going to go straight out to the mass market and see what they think of the software. So it really took that a shift in terms of how we approach the business. Okay, interesting. So you guys had like six or seven different types of products you kind of spun up and like we're testing. So what was the idea for CoSchedule and how did you guys decide that was the one to move forward with? Yeah, CoSchedule was actually two different software ideas. We had one idea that was like a calendar. So we were teaching marketing teams. We were actually doing training and stuff. Like we were writing blog posts and doing this stuff for them. And we just thought like, 
you know, they want to write blog posts, we want to build stuff. And so we started trying to like coach them on how to do it. And we had like these whole training seminars and everything. And part of it was just creating an editorial calendar. Like you just got to think about like the month ahead, who's going to create content. And so, okay, well, it makes a lot of sense to software eyes that because Google Calendar is not a very satisfying place for that to be. Like, why not mm-hmm. put on an interactive calendar? We'll integrate directly with WordPress. So like they're creating the content on the calendar and they're going to publish it and it's just all connected. And then we also had this idea of like, well, you know, once you publish a piece of content, social media is real pain in the butt because you got to copy paste everything, the links and everything out. And there's just a lot of extra work there in terms of social sharing. So it was this idea of like incorporating social media directly into WordPress via plugin, plus this calendar that may be connected to WordPress. And it's like, well, these are both on WordPress. Let's just combine them and make one product. And so it was pretty early on. We never actually wrote any serious code on it as an independent product, but they originally lived as two separate ideas that got combined one day on a flight back from Atlanta. Awesome. So at the time, like, did you guys have any customers for this yet? Or like, how did you choose that you're going to move forward with it? None, no customers, just a good idea. And so one thing I always say is that we started blogging before we write wrote code. The very first thing we did was actually put up a little website, a launch page and a blog and started writing. I think we just launched one blog post, just kind of announcing the vision, like announcing this idea and kind of laying out the two problems that I just talked about and how we felt that they could be solved in one product. There was a very, very minimalistic version. If you go on the CoSketcher blog and you go like way, way back, it's still live and it's still out there actually. But there was like this very minimalistic picture of the calendar and that was it, right? And so we sent that blog post out to a few people we knew in the WordPress community and in content publishing and in marketing, got a handful of blog posts published about it and just say, hey, you know, this is coming and got a bunch of attention. I think we had a few, I don't know, couple thousand like subscribers on our email list within a couple months. I mean, it grew pretty quickly to where it felt like, okay, there's a group of people out there that are interested in this. We need to pursue this. And that's from there, we didn't start coding then yet either. I actually, we just made a bunch of mockups in Photoshop and stitched them together using Keynote and or PowerPoint or something. Like you kind of click on things and it made it feel like the software was moving and interacting. And so we took that email list of all those people that signed up on our launch page we went and found all of the good domain names, right? Like throw out the Gmail, throw out Yahoo, like really throw out Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> but she got like, hey, this university or, you know, Brand X, right? And it's like, okay, that makes sense. And so we reached out to them, scheduled a phone call and said, hey, we'd like to give you a preview of what we're building and get your feedback. And I did this little keynote slide deck for them. And it was probably a five to eight minute little presentation. And I just had a handful of questions that I asked them. I recorded every single one of those calls. And then, you know, the whole team at the agency, we ended up watching them and just kind of really kind of understanding what customers were after and what they liked about it and didn't like about it. Interesting. Okay. So that's a good spot. So right before there, you guys built up a list of a couple thousand people to launch this to. Were you guys getting like a decent amount of website traffic at the time when you posted this to your blog? You know, we had been blogging quite a bit at Today Made. So I think at that time, even at Today Made, we had a pretty decent sized email list, you know, a few thousand, I mean, sub 10 probably, but it was pretty large. And so we had like a good fire hose that we could kind of point at it. We ended up building a whole different list at CoSchedule, but we were able to take some of that today made traffic and push it over to CoSchedule. And so that helped a lot. And, but I mean, relatively speaking, like it was not huge traffic. Like it definitely started at zero and just kind of slowly ticked up from there for sure. What about with these bloggers? So besides them being friends, did you do anything or like send any kind of messages that would incentivize them or get them excited about writing about you guys? Probably. I remember sending influencers and stuff, you know, t-shirts and stickers and those types of things. I don't think there was anything that we did specifically there that made or break co-schedule. It was really useful for that initial push and kind of building up that list. What we focused on more so was like using that list to grow the list, right? So we published one to two pieces of content per week. I kept it very focused on like the product we were building and the problems we were trying to solve. Like, here's what we think is wrong with editorial calendars right now. Like, this is what we see people using. You know, what do you use, right? Like just kind of leaving that question. Here's what we think is wrong with social scheduling. Here's what we think are some of the best practices in social scheduling and kind of going over some of like the bigger opinions that we had that we were going to take into the product and just putting it out there on a blog post. We'd email that post to everyone on the list. We'd encourage them to talk and share and, and that sort of thing. But we just kind of treated it like this community and we kept feeding it. That sort of just naturally built up some hype and excitement, I think. 
Cool. So you really focused on that community collaboration versus necessarily writing for SEO and trying to build traffic. Yeah, early on we did. Later on, we definitely converted to traffic and SEO, but early on it was just much more about idea validation. And I think that's an important piece, right? Like sometimes if your audience isn't growing, like even a modest amount, like mm-hmm. that is a sign that your idea might not be taking off. Like this was not the first time we had followed this pattern. And we had plenty of other products where it was just you pulling teeth to get one visitor. And so it was definitely modest results in the beginning, but there was something different. Like we were feeling a different momentum behind CoSchedule than we ever had on any other product we had launched. Okay. All right. That sounds good. So you guys start doing these like one-on-one calls with people. I assume they were one-on-one. Yep. Yeah. And then you're not selling anything at that point. You're still just collecting feedback on the product. Yeah. We never really did anything. I know some folks do that where you try to get them on contracts or sell them. We never did anything like that. We were really just talking product and mostly trying to understand problems. I remember, you know, saying, Hey, can you pull up this Excel spread? Like they're talking about this massive Excel spreadsheet that they use. So I just asked, you know, can you pull it up? And I'm like snapping screenshots like this thing, we've got to figure out how to eliminate this spreadsheet or their outlook calendars, whatever. So like, is a lot more of just understanding, like just trying to understand them. You know, I remember reading books. I've written a couple of blog posts on this. There's a book I used to recommend, but I think it's called Interviewing Your Users. But like just understanding that as software creators and entrepreneurs, we tend to ask these sort of bad questions. Like we ask questions like, would you buy? And stuff like that, the wrong type of questions. And you kind of have to learn to really understand the problem and then the emotional reasons that that user might buy a product versus asking them, would they buy? Like... It's not even a real question, right? Because there's so much emotion wrapped into buying. It's just not a good place to start. Okay. Yeah. The book was called, I believe, Interviewing Users Uncover Compelling Insights. Yes. Yeah. So we'll get that linked up in the show notes. Okay. So you're going through, you're showing them designs. You're like looking at the problems, how they're like doing this current process. So you guys develop this kind of idea of like, this is what we think version one of CoSchedule should be. So what do you do next after these interviews? We started building products. We did kind of a really early MVP where you could do some basic scheduling inside of WordPress and we'd spit everything from WordPress and your social media out into a ICS calendar. So you could look at your calendar was Google. We didn't even build the calendar to start with. And so it was pretty crude, but it was useful, right? Like if you're doing blogging, you create your blog post and right below is your messages. And we slowly started pulling in their messages from their posts or images from their posts. We'd pull in their favorite or featured image, and they just kept enhancing that. So we just gave that to all those users for free. Anybody that was on that email list, we let them let them do it for free. And it was a huge value just in terms of like, they were just testing our plugin. And we learned a ton about how to build a really stable, reliable WordPress plugin, which is not always easy. Hmm. So were these users, are they like still using the software for free? Or it was just like that version? When we actually launched, we ended up moving them all to paid plans. Eventually, we gave them big, big grant offering periods. But it's always important to us at that time, like at some point, we need paying users and we need to validate people are willing to pay for this service, not just utilize it because it's there, right? Okay, so yeah, so you built this kind of like pre-launch, you built a community around it, you launched this MVP out to them, and then everything's perfect, you got the best product and you guys quit developing, right? Yeah, I haven't developed in about four or five years now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Yeah, so what happened after that? I just kept building. I mean... You know, if you fast forward five years at a SaaS server, it's basically the same thing, right? You're constantly adding more product. And as you make your product more complex and add more features, your product becomes a better solution for larger customers. And so you slowly are moving up market into, you know, from micro businesses up to, you know, kind of mid so your SMBs and mid market and so on and so forth. And you just kind of keep moving and, and your product requirements change. So development is never done. I've had investors ask me, like, why do you, like, it's done. Like, you guys have customers, like, right? But your customers always obviously need to be seeing new features and they expect software to get better and more powerful over time, not stay the same. And so lots of that. Yeah. Okay. So we'll get into some of these other strategies like marketing channels, but I guess like while we're on the topic of feedback, is this still the same method of customer feedback that you use to continue to improve the product? I do still prefer talking directly to someone about it. I still do it quite a bit at conferences and stuff. We'll meet up with current users or just, I love to stand at the booth and just talk to marketers. It's still, so you can still find me there doing it. But like every day, our customer success team is doing it and passing those things back. And sometimes even as a product owners and product team will like 
send them specific questions that we want them to just kind of ask customers over the next couple of weeks or just be thinking about. So, you know, as you know, how we get feedback has changed a lot as our team has grown and we have people, but yeah, we still, at every plan level, starting from our smallest plans to our largest plan, we have customer success folks who, you know, one of their roles is to book calls and talk directly to customers. And we always think that that's kind of the best way to do it still. But I mean, we do it all. Like there's surveys, you use social media, you use emails, you get in support. We'll try to categorize that feedback, but you never stop listening. But still talking is still better than most anything else. Okay. Awesome. All right. Let's jump into a marketing strategy next. So you guys have built your website to over 1.5 million monthly page views. I'm guessing that drives a lot of growth for you guys. So let's talk about some of the original SEO strategies. So at first, you guys were doing content based around really sharing the product vision and getting community feedback. When you started making the switch towards like you were writing content to get traffic, what were some of the things that you were doing to grow your really SEO traffic? Yeah, I mean, I'd say in the early days, we probably weren't as good at SEO as we should have been. We would always would do some preliminary research on keywords, right? Just even just as simple as Google search and just trying to understand the phrases and the things that people were looking for and using. Obviously, like everyone's familiar with like the AdWords keyword ranker, like we use that from very, very early on. So we were always focused on it. And eventually, I think after year two, we just kind of made a rule that like every piece of content we create needs to have a declared keyword or keyword phrase before we actually go into creating it. And there's some rules like we're going to mention it so many times, we're going to include in our headlines, and we're just going to make this like a normal part of the process. So it wasn't there from day one, but it was definitely something that happened in a year one and a half or two. But once we started doing that, like it really became a pivotal point, right? There was a bunch of different things that went into that SEO keywording was one of them, but those really became the point where growth really took off. And some of it's just we had enough critical mass, like we had enough email lists where we could leverage that, build on it, and kind of becomes that snowball. Okay. So you guys focused on keyword research. What was your content frequency? Like how often were you publishing? You said two to three times a week. Was that consistent? Yeah, we've never gone below that probably. So very, very early on, I think we did three to three posts. I know there's a time period where we experiment with five posts per week. Right now we're at two, probably more, you know, our average is probably at three per week. And we probably haven't missed it in five years. Okay. What about like your guys' promotion strategy as far as like guest blogging or promoting content you guys are writing on your site? How did you guys go about doing that? We still do a lot of it. I still do guest posts on a weekly basis, usually a couple of them. And I, my content tends to be going out to guest post opportunities more frequently than our own site anymore, particularly with the launch of the book and stuff that's happened even more. Still posting two times a week internally. We have had experience with having guest authors on the site. Currently don't do that, but it could happen again. Why is that? Does it just take a lot of work or like you're not getting repeat writers? It doesn't save any time. Yeah. Really? Like we can create a post and piece of content that's like a lot more strategically focused. And by the time we put in editing and coaching and getting them to the quality we want, it's just as easy for us to do it ourselves. So sure. Yeah. We found that too. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but first a quick thanks to our sponsor lead quizzes. If you want to grow your business to seven figures and beyond, you must learn how to generate leads predictably. When I first started my business, lead generation felt like riding a roller coaster. I would have huge sales months and then months with nothing. This happened because I relied solely on referrals and networking to grow my business. Predicting growth and investing in the future were frightening because I didn't have control over my lead generation. That was before we created lead quizzes. Now I predictably generate leads in my sleep and have stopped worrying about where the next sale will come from. Top marketers like Neil Patel and Lewis House have used lead quizzes to increase their lead capture by up to 500%. Think about it. Quizzes are fun, engaging, and you can offer personalized feedback in exchange for your quiz taker's contact information. Lead quizzes is a software that allows you to set up high converting quizzes quickly without having to hire an expensive programmer. In fact, our users have generated over 3 million leads for their businesses. Take control of your lead generation today and start your 14-day free trial by going to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. So you did do some guest blogging. Like I know you guys guest blog for Noah Kagan. Is that right? I did. Yeah, I did uh, at least one post a while back. Yeah. So some posts like that, were those pretty significant drivers of traffic or referrals for you guys? Actually, yes, it was great. Tra- it was great tra- for traffic, for sure. And I'm certainly I'm sure email subscribers. And so once you go from there, it's a little hard to like say, how does it trickle into customers? But 
oftentimes like the, the posts that drive the most traffic aren't always the most valuable ones, right? Like particularly as our audience has, we still have a lot of solopreneurs and bloggers and individuals that use our product every day, but we increasingly have more marketing professionals as well, right? So like marketing managers, social managers, content managers, stuff like that. And so that type of audience, like there's not as many of them, Mm -hmm. right? So traffic isn't always the best signifier of access to some customer segments. Sure. Okay. Let's talk about your podcast. So you guys launched a podcast called Actionable Marketing in 2016. Can you walk us through a little bit about like your launch strategy and how that's impacted your guys' growth? Yeah. So when we first launched it, we really thought it was going to be a tool for driving signups, right? We kind of think of it as it's an interview type show. So we bring on influencers and you think, okay, well, they're going to share it with their audience. There's some good virality there. I will include some really good calls to action. Maybe we'll offer people a longer trial, all of those types of things. And I'd say we probably did that for the first six to eight months, maybe a year and interviewed actually a whole bunch of customers even and had very strong connections to CoSchedule throughout many of the episodes, particularly the early episodes. There's always a segment where they end up answering a question with, well, we use co-schedule to do that, right? So, (laughs) which is not necessarily, that was not necessarily the focus, but it always kind of seemed to happen pretty naturally. But I think for us now, like we don't really position the podcast that way. It was not all that good at driving trial signups and actual use of the product. And so you kind of have to take a step back at some point and say like, well, what's the value if it's not driving trial signups? And I'd say like there was a day at co-schedule particularly in our first three years, where that would have been the death nail, right? Like if it's not driving trial signups, it doesn't have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so some of that's just like maturing. And as you get larger as a company, there's other reasons that you do things. And so we use a podcast now has very different goals. And subscribers actually has been growing more now that we've gotten away from some of like really trying to think of it as a trial driver. And it's flourishing now, but it's purposes change, right? As you grow. And that's just kind of inevitable. So what is the purpose now for the podcast? So now it's a bit more about continuing to position CoSchedule as a thought leader in the industry. You know, we always kind of believe that if we teach people to help think like us, right, in terms of how they approach their marketing and strategy, then our product is a better fit for them. It makes more sense to them, becomes a natural fit. But the other one is just working with influencers. We have a lot of very influential guests and that allows us to work on partnerships with them. It just creates introductions. It just creates these back channels that we're utilizing all the time for different integrations or improvements to the product. Some of them, you know, that now use the product and tell friends about it. So we use it in a very different way. So you know, now we really think about it as a way to connect with influencers and kind of bring them into the co-schedule family, so to speak. So we've had other marketing partnerships and projects that have come from interview guests. We've had new customers, like we get to talking, we give them a quick demo of how we're using our product and they jump in and now they're, they're talking about it with their audience and their friends. And, and so we have enough traffic and subscribers to where we can appeal to some pretty strong guests. And so that's been a really good driver for us just in terms of influence instead of any other thing too, like get to keep in mind like a podcast, like it's super hard to connect. Hey, I listened to your podcast and that's why I signed up for a trial. Like good luck, right? Like it's hard to measure. And the other one is just this realization that with when you're creating content and you're doing content marketing, it's not likely that a new customer will interact with your content once. More importantly, they'll probably interact with it like, a half a dozen or two dozen times before they it takes a while, right? And so we need to build up a library of content to create CoSchedule as this trusted brand and trusted source versus just like one piece of content that's going to drip in customers through the funnel. Like it takes a lot. Sure. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about like your email list growth strategy. So you guys have built a huge email list of 350,000 subscribers plus. So what were some of the drivers of that? Were you just using like the website traffic and converting those? Were you doing webinars with other people? How did you guys drive that? Yeah, we've done it primarily through SEO and our blog content. And so there's a couple things like we wrote a book called 10X Marketing Formula. In the book, I talk about a something called competition-free content. And really what it is, is a framework for starting to think about the content you're creating and producing as a sort of rising above the competition, right? So for a lot of folks, like... Five years ago, if you were blogging every day, like we were, or, you know, at least three or four times a week, like just that alone, that volume could get you to stand out from your competitors because there's probably a lot of people in your industry that aren't doing it at all. Mm-hmm. But today, who's not doing that is the bigger question. Like everyone's doing all that stuff. So you have to find ways to like completely separate what you're doing from them and have your content and whatever you're creating sort of rise above it. So we call that competition-free content. And for us, that kind of looked at like us going around looking at all of our competitor sites, 
and not really looking at their product, but looking at their marketing. How are they sharing their message? Like how often are they using their blog? How many times do they publish? How long are those posts? How many images are in them? How are they using social media to promote their content? How are they emphasizing email list growth? Like what are they doing? And it turned out like they were all following the really basic best practices of content creation. They're all creating posts like five to a thousand words, right? Like your minimum for SEO. They probably weren't doing a lot of keywording. They probably weren't doing a lot with headlines. They might have had one image in there, but it was like one stock photo or something like that. And so I said, okay, like these are all opportunities. Like every single one of those things are the opportunities for us to do something 10 times better and make a bigger impact than what their content will make, right? At the end of the day, we all may target the same keywords, but if our content is 10 times better than theirs, like we're going to win on Google. So our posts have for the last, I don't know, three years, maybe two, three years have been 2,500 words or at least 2,500 words each. It forces us to be more actionable and more specific with what we're doing. It allows us to teach more, right? Not just like, hey, here's five tips to improve your marketing. Like, no, like here's a marketing strategy, like how to actually do it. Like, this is how we did our planning. This is how we implemented it. This is what our results were like. This is what, you know, how you could do it yourself. And then we would actually just like take some of those templates and things that we were doing. We just released them as free downloads that people could take away. So no one was doing downloads in our space. So now we do a download, a free customized download for every piece of content. Like we, we decided to put the work in to do that. We create customized infographics. We've had a designer do that for a couple of years now. So like just all these different things that we started to do that no one else is willing to do. And all of a sudden, like we're shooting to the top on every single page, our authority is going up and everything starts growing and snowballing from there. Awesome. And so that SEO traffic you guys were building, that's really what drove like the majority of these email signups. Yeah. So SEO is a big portion of how we grew that list, but we also released what I call some 10X projects. One of them was our headline analyzer, uh, which we still make available for free today. And so that is a tool that you know people can come to type in their blog post headline and we kind of rank it based on a bunch of the data we've compiled that co-schedule. So we have a ton of huge database of blog headlines and we know how many social shares they all got. We broke it down, kind of figure out what the best practices were and made an algorithm that allowed us to kind of score each headline on how likely we felt it was in order to get more social shares. And so we put that out there. We included a free guide. You can use the headline analyzer for free, but, in, but you can also download a guide on some of the most powerful keywords that you can use and emotional words that you include in headlines that help get more clicks. And in order to get that download, you enter your email address, et cetera, et cetera. So we've done that with, we have an email subject analyzer. We have a social message optimizer as well. So just using data that we had that no one else had, it was unique to us. And we were able to take it and adapt it into a free tool that made a really good lead, lead magnet that way. Awesome. So these are some great strategies. I want to talk about some areas that held you guys back. So the first one that comes to mind is like, you guys are running your agency and you're building a product at the same time. And so I have personal experience going through this when we had our digital agency and then started lead quizzes, yep. it becomes really hard to focus on a product. So can you tell me a little bit about that time and like what was going on and how you guys got through it? I'd say the hardest phase as an entrepreneur was definitely that phase, right? Where we're trying to balance cash flowing an agency, new business acquisition for that business to just keep it afloat and building co-schedule, which at the time, you know, when particularly once you start seeing success happen, right? And you start seeing people really interested in co-schedule, like it's really hard to focus on everything else. Like that's where you want to put all of your attention. And you know that there's future revenue there. Like you know it's there, but you can't do it. So for us, you know, it probably took I don't know, eight or nine months, I think, before we finally launched Co-Schedule. We certainly could have done it faster if we would have been able to build it full time, but it took us a little longer because we were balancing client projects. But that's not to say there wasn't a time where we just put it all in line, right? There was. There was this day where we just said, we're done. No more projects, no more proposals. We're not sending anywhere out. We're saying no to new business. I remember writing emails to clients saying, you know, just letting you know we're decided not to bid on this project. We wish you the best of luck. The end, right? And it's kind of terrifying because dinner is attached to those projects. And I had three small kids at the time. So we bet the farm and we ended up, you know, looking for funding and taking out some angel funding at that time. And that really allowed us to split the business. So we ended up taking about half the team at Today Made, moving them full-time to co-schedule, including Justin and myself went full-time to co-schedule. And then we actually did a couple hires back at Today Made, project manager, operations person, and a senior designer and developer that could come in and kind of fill our shoes. And so split the company, actually ran them both for uh, about a year or so before 
we sold today, made and had acquired. But like that phase of like, do you believe in this enough? in co-schedule enough. It was a big one because we had to stop taking clients. Then we started raising money. And by the way, like if you're running an agency plus building a product, like don't add fundraising to the top of it. Like it is in January in North Dakota, no less, we're driving around talking to investors. So like, it's just a lot, like a lot had to fall into place and it was very messy and stressful at the time, but I don't regret it now. It was the right thing to do. Yeah. And I'm guessing that's, like you said, it's probably one of the hardest things you went through because you talk about even with your 10x versus 10% formula with your book, like if you're focusing on multiple things, you only have so much focus. If you're anything like us, like right. we got our agency to a certain point and then like we couldn't really take it much further without taking some focus off of the software or vice versa. Right. Well, I think one thing for us at Tsunami that it helped out a lot is just bringing in somebody earlier for operations. Like we were still doing too much of the operations and sales. And so we got lucky and we had some good hires that we could bring in very quickly and they did a great job and they actually ran today made. And once they took over, we today made actually made more money without me and Justin running it than with us. So, you know, figure that out. And so like, I think, you know, delegating sooner would certainly help. That'd be a big remedy to that problem. But at the same time, like I always go back to that point. Like if you're focused on two things, you're not focused on anything, right? You can't focus hundred percent on two things. So yeah. So you have to make hard decisions too. Okay. One more thing. So like one of the other areas that held you guys back was as you guys matured, your client base kind of matured as well. So like, how did that impact, you know, your company? How did that kind of hold you back? And how'd you get through it? Yeah, I think we've never tried to let it hold us back. But I think the reality is, is that as your product changes, and as your customer base changes, you have to make decisions or release features that you know, are only going to help a certain set of users. Right. Particularly in the early days, if I'm going to build something, I don't have my engineers spend time building something. Like I want it to affect as many users and improve as many users as possible. Mm-hmm. And generally speaking, that's how we did it for a long time. But at some point, as you mature, you have to start making decisions where there's a really big growth opportunity here. And I have to start basing some of those decisions based on growth velocity, right? Long term versus just short term happiness for certain customers. So like certain group of customers is asking for features. I think they're a good idea. We should build them, but we can only pick one and we have to pick some projects and some features that are for larger customer bases. And so as a SaaS product, like that's, those are hard decisions to make, right? But it comes back to that focus. And you always have to be constantly focused on growth and moving upward versus getting too stuck in the past and some of those types of things. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, we're nearing the, like the end of our episode here. So let's run through a couple of our like final questions. Garrett, did you experience a time when you thought your business would fail? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Is there one specific? And like, what did you do to get through it? Well, the most specific was the story I told of the early days, right? Like we kind of put in a place where all both businesses could fail. You technically have two businesses that are successful, but if you can't keep cash coming in, right, either we lose the team, we lose our, 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 at some point, like we can only go out with a paycheck or with smaller paychecks for so long. We have families to support. I'm not sure that feeling ever goes away. Like you kind of always feel like you could lose it all any minute. And I think that's probably a good thing. That's sort of what being an entrepreneur is. Okay. Garrett, what's the one thing you did that had the biggest impact on your growth? Free tools like the headline analyzer. Okay. How come? They just brought us a ton of traffic that was the right audience type, right? Like it was those two things that it had a virality. People were referencing it in blog posts, tweeting about it. And it was useful to our core demographic, right? Like it matched those two criteria and we were able to effectively use it to convert customers. And like, once you figure out that formula, you can ride it a long ways. Okay. What's been an area that you've personally had to evolve and grow in to grow your business? Delegating leadership, like talking about before about, you know, we should have brought in somebody to do operations and sales early on. You know, as entrepreneurs, our minds can wander, like we get a new idea, we kind of can move on. And then you get frustrated because there's this other thing that you're working on that's pulling you back in. And so like learning to delegate and how to manage and how to trust people and coach your talent to be good. And they're not always going to be as... You always feel like you could do it better. But once you start to get into a point where you're delegating and they're executing it better than you would have, like it's really, really satisfying, but it's a hard journey to get to that point. Okay. I think that covers a lot of stuff that could cover hiring management, leadership. Is there maybe one book that you'd recommend that helped you out a lot there? I really like the book, The Score Will Take Care of Itself by Bill Walsh. He was a coach for the 49ers back in the, I think, early 90s, late 80s. And just really good. I think it's simple. Like I like simple frameworks. Like They're really complicated leadership frameworks and stuff. But this book really just kind of gives you a simple framework of like, 
if you do the right things and you push people in the right ways and you motivate some of the simple right ways, like the score, like the results of your company will take care of itself. And it's a really powerful concept. Okay. Garrett, if you could go back in time and start over, what would you tell yourself? I tell myself to do all the big decisions that we made to do them sooner rather than later. Like you kind of raising money for co-schedule, we started it two or three months sooner. We would save ourselves a lot of headache, but you kind of in indecision, right? And it, part of it too is like, I don't know if we could have, right? We didn't have it. Like by the time we started raising money, we had three or 400 customers. We had zero three months before that. So it's hard to gauge, but I think there's almost every decision that you're kind of sitting on. Once you make it and get past it, like you probably should have made it sooner. And you'll learn to start trusting your instincts a little more as you get further along in entrepreneurship versus when you're kind of a young little startup. So I just tell myself to make a bunch of decisions way faster. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, Garrett, where can people learn more about CoSchedule and also connect with you? Well, CoSchedule is coschedule.com. I got a whole bunch of more stuff and more frameworks on how we grew. And in my book, The 10X Marketing Formula, that is available on Amazon, or you can get the first chapter for free at coschedule.com slash 10 book. And then Twitter, it's kind of my mainstay and I'm Garrett underscore moon on there. Awesome. All right. We'll get those all linked up in the show notes. Thank you so much for coming on, Garrett. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. Hey, thanks again for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more about Garrett Moon and the lessons he shared today or read our show notes, visit leadquizzes.com slash 22. If you'd like to start generating more leads for your business and get a free trial to lead quizzes, go to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Next week, I'll be interviewing Raj Jana on how he built Java Press to $2.6 million in sales, starting out as a side hustle while working at Chevron. Please subscribe to our show so you don't miss this next episode. I'm Jeremy Ellens, and you've been listening to Journey to Seven Figures.